Hey everybody, Coach Keith Kepner here. I'm going to talk about how drillers make killers. Drills and boxing are possibly the thing that's going to help you get to the next level. This really applies if you're a beginner, which I mean by beginner, zero to 12 months. But also I've seen it impact people dramatically at any level of the game, including professional. And you also see professionals do this across the world and across history, but it's something you don't see very often, or at least it's not uh, videoed. And just like everything that I do my best to talk about on this channel, I'm not gonna waste your time talking about things that are of low benefit, that are, are of low impact, things that uh, sound cool or look cool, but things that are going to make a difference, and as you start implementing them consistently into your training, they will make a big difference. So without further delay, let's jump into it. What do I mean by a drill, right? Because obviously the word drill, it could be anything. It could be a bag drill. It could be a shadow boxing drill, which of course, as you saw in the last video, the importance of shadow boxing. I went through a whole presentation like this. It, it could be many things. It could be a conditioning drill. What do I mean by drill and by drillers make killers? What I'm talking about is what some people refer to as sparring drills or partner drills. Something you do with another person. Because this thing called boxing is something you do with another human. And it's not something that you do with an, 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 an inanimate object. That's something that I harp on a lot with people that I work with. Is that remember... We're, we're not trying to get good at boxing funky little weird gear. We're trying to get good at boxing people, all right? But drills are the bridge to sparring for beginners. They're the bridge. They're, they're, they're what connects your training, whether it be shadow boxing, bag work, mitt work, to sparring. It's not going to be bag work. That's not the bridge to sparring in your boxing journey, or at least the most effective bridge. Yes, you can try to jump over a, a crevasse, but if you have a bridge to help you go across it, you're probably gonna be more safe and more successful. It's not mitt work. Mitt work, bag work, they're great tools. They can be done well, they can be done poorly, but they're not, again, the best bridge. They might be, think of a rope that's hung across uh, you know, a big gap but it's not as safe uh, or as succinct a journey as a bridge. Not the speed bag, of course. You don't need me to tell you that. <laughs> but just to put it in there, because too often we think of boxing training, and in many boxing facilities, it's all about, you know, mitt work, bag work, doing speed bag. You do all that, and then you spar, right? You do all that, and then you spar, and that's it. And that's, if you've done boxing, that's probably been your journey for over 80% of people watching this. Or if you're gonna get into boxing, that will probably be your journey, unless you plug some extra things in there. All right, drills are the bridge to sparring for beginners, why? When you are starting out, and again, I mean starting out, meaning you know your first few months of boxing, you are doing things, punching, like I said, bags, mitts, air, right? All this stuff has benefit. But you're doing something which is nothing like the, the actual thing you're doing. It's really not. It's just like if you were doing dry practice for swimming, trying to learn swimming, but you never jumped in the pool. Sparring is the pool. Now, you need to be in the shallow end, though, maybe, first. You're sure you could dump, jump into the deep end, right, and sink or swim. But a less traumatic way is uh, to go into the shallow end. And start off there so you know you have that safety mark, right? Or you have some floaties on you so you make sure you don't sink. That's what a drill is, a partner drill. It's you have the floaties on. You're in the shallow end, right? Uh, you're in the kiddie pool, whatever. But you're getting an idea of hitting people uh, and defending against punches in a controlled fashion. Too often, we'll hit a bag. We'll get used to that. We'll hit mitts. We'll get used to that. We'll shadow box, we'll get used to that. And then we literally jump in the deep end or in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with sparring. And it can it can be a extreme experience, which again, we, we can all make it through and we all have made it through, but there's a better way. Now, 
It's also a bridge to expand your toolbox if you're a more advanced boxer, if you've been around for a while. Why is that? Because if you're having trouble, yes, you can absolutely work on techniques with mitt work, right? And bag and shadow boxing, of course, naturally. You know that. But let's say you you need to be better at countering jabs. You need to be better at countering a certain punch. Then in sparring and in fights is showing that is a vulnerable place. Or let's say you tend to be open for certain punches. Drills are the key. That combined with constant rehearsal and shadow boxing is the key to help you get better at it. Yes, you can reinforce these things on the mitt, but again, a mitt is a mitt. It's not a punch, it's different. Uh, and so within only specific situations can a mitt actually be superior, but in the majority of situations, a drill, I argue, is actually going to be superior to help you get better at a certain technique that you're not doing or need to do more of or get used to or understand better. But you need to drill the right way because if you drill the wrong way, it's not going to be of much benefit, particularly if you're more advanced. And I'm going to talk about the differences of two types of drills a little bit later. If you only drill in the certain way that I'm going to talk about first, and you're a little bit more advanced, a little bit more experienced, there's going to be diminishing returns. Now, make sure you stick around for later, <laughs> where, I'm, where I'm going to talk about this, about how to make drills more effective if you've already been boxing. So that's what I'm going to talk about later. Make sure you stick around for that. Make sure, by the way, you like, subscribe, buy me a coffee with a super thanks. You know, it's down there kind of, uh, let's see, which way is it? That way, on the bottom of the video, below it, you'll see like a heart, super thanks, or become a channel member. And uh, there's a lot of benefits to that, including me reviewing your sparring, fight fights, and also just training in general. And I'll give you feedback just like this. Uh, as well as, I'm going to have some more videos. I have a few videos out, but more videos out for only channel members, whether you're level 1 or level 2, both people get it. All right. Now, when I was boxing back in the the 2000s, uh, I didn't see much drills because on TV <clears throat> for the fight buildup, like think about the HBO 24-7 type stuff or whatever was the different things that were around at that time. I, it's all a hodgepodge to me of time. But you saw a lot of just mitt work. Uh, and of course, you know, it's the era of Floyd Mayweather. So obviously he popularized kind of the flow mitt work type stuff. But you see the mitt work, you see the bag work. You see the jumping rope. Of course, you see the speed bag, right? You see all this stuff that is interesting to see for a casual fan, all right? So I didn't see much drills at all until really social media came about. And because of the amount that people film training, you get to see a little bit more behind the curtain, right? You don't get to just see the media workouts. You get to see some stuff that typically wasn't documented that much before. Because it's not that interesting or exciting. Two guys doing a drill to a beginning boxing person or a boxing fan is not entertaining. But someone really showing some speed on the speed bag uh, or amazing uh, ability on the jump rope or looking flashy on the mitts, that's exciting. That's interesting. That's unique. And uh, But as we know, we don't need to go and train to look cool. We need to focus on training that has the most benefit. So this is what I saw was a bunch of that. And, and I've been guilty of this too. What do I mean? When I've had different, uh, very small, very small media, you know, uh, groups take video and things like that of maybe someone I'm working with training and things like that at any level, you try to make it a little bit more interesting, try to make it fun. You know, like, hey, let's go flip a tire and, and, and film that because it looks cool, right? Whereas like this person never did tire training. Now you could say this is not being honest, but it's 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 sports entertainment. Combat sports and all of the sports, but combat sports in particularly is sports entertainment, right? With the buildup of the press conferences and all this other stuff like that, it's all sports entertain, entertainment. And that's where fighters <clears throat> that are overly boring aren't gonna do as well as fighters that are a little bit more exciting. And of course, as you probably know, there's a lot of trainers throughout the history of boxing that they mold it styles to serve both purposes, to serve the entertainment factor, the marketability factor, uh, as well as the winning factor of the sport. These are just facts, all right? But I'm not talking about all that part of this. I'm talking about actually getting better at the sport and progressing, which is why you're watching this video. Now, there's two types of drills. 
Uh, but first, before we talk about those two types of drills, let's talk about drills or drill prerequisite. All right, so the prerequisites that we need bef to understand before we start drilling in order, to, in order to have good drills. Now, the main overarching theme here is you need to make it real. Make the drill real. What does that mean? It means you need to aim for target areas. You'd be amazed, or maybe you know, but you'd be amazed, maybe you don't know, so you need to, you need to hear this, at when you have two people drilling together, right? Let's say it's a, it's a drill of just somebody throwing a jab at somebody else, right? That's a pretty basic drill. Just, hey, you and I, you're going to throw a jab at me. You're going to throw single jabs, and I'm going to defend that single jab. That's a very, very basic drill. You'd be amazed at how much even people with experience will start aiming at things that are not the goal. Just like any other sport, boxing has goals. It has scoring areas. It has the places you want to aim for uh, in order to, you know, quote unquote, win a point. I mean, obviously, pro boxing a little bit different than amateur boxing, but regardless, if you aim for the jaw on somebody, you aim for the jaw on someone, we can all agree that that's a beneficial place to aim. Now, somebody in a drill, though, will automatically revert to their mitt work. And even the guy that's getting thrown at will revert to mitt work. And they'll start holding their hand up to catch a jab like they're holding mitts. And this person who is, only does mitt work, start, and, or even if they've just done some drills but never, haven't been focused on this, they'll start aiming for that glove. And that is a big sin as a boxer. You only need to be aiming for different things like that to set up things. But you don't need to unconsciously be aiming for gloves that's what a fighter wants you to do a fighter if you're gonna if you're gonna box me please aim for my gloves non-stop like the whole time please please if my hands on the side of my face aim for that hand that's on the side of my face with a straight punch don't aim for my face right that'd be lovely I, I would love it if you purposely missed every single shot towards any of my vital areas and uh you probably make me look decent as a boxer right but if you aim for the target areas you get used to that, you're going to give them trouble. And remember, a good puncher, like I talked about in the power punching video, they have not only the ability to produce force and the timing to deliver it, but they have the accuracy, right? If you hit somebody not in one of the most beneficial places, then it's not going to do what you want it to do, right? And the more accurate you are, you can actually expend less energy but have more accuracy and really hurt somebody and take them out of there. So when you're doing a drill, you have to make it real by aiming for target areas. And it's like I tell people, uh, I'll have two people drilling because we do a lot of drills uh, with, with our curriculum and stuff like that. And you'll have two guys working together. Let's say, you know, they've only been boxing like a couple weeks or a month or whatever. And they're drilling together and you'll see them start falling into this pattern or they'll start off in this pattern where they're aiming at gloves, not faces or, or jaws. They're aiming at arms instead of body, Right. And you tell them, this is one of the lines that I tell everybody, is that, hey, let's say you're throwing punches at, uh, at me, right? I would, I would tell, that, tell you that's throwing punches at me, like, hey, like if Keith goes into a fight and gets knocked out, it's your fault. You're to blame for it. Because oftentimes the reason people are saying I'm aiming for gloves and stuff like that is I'm being nice. Well, I'm being nice. You know, I'm purposely missing them because I'm being nice. Well, hey, you being nice, nice can be actually being mean, right? You can be nice to somebody. And, you know, be nice to that person that, uh, you know, should turn their life around and you're too nice to them and you enable them to do bad and you're actually hurting them. And same thing goes with boxing. Boxing is, is the hurt business. It's a hard sport and it's a dangerous sport. And if you're making someone believe that they have better defense than they do, than they do by purposely missing them, you are doing them a disservice and yourself a disservice. But obviously, we're, we're more impacted by how we affect other people. So... That's where I find it very beneficial to remember that as a boxer or even as a coach to remind your fighters that, hey, you're hurting your team member right now. You're making it so that they're more, more vulnerable because everything, every single thing you do, just to be neurotic about it, but every single thing you do in training, you're building up a habit. You're building up either what to do or what not to do. And if you're building up blocking a punch that is aimed at an area that is no one would be aiming for you are reinforcing something that's going to be crippling down the road. And you're doing that to your partner if you're purposely missing them, all right? And that's where the fix for this is, guys, when you drill, keep you have your mouthpiece in because you should be used to that. When I boxed, my dad made me always have my mouthpiece in because 
that's what you're going to be using, right? And there's not going to be a time and a place ever in the sport of boxing where you're not going to have a mouthpiece in your mouth. Now, I would feel weird if I didn't have a mouthpiece in the mouth. That's reinforcing good habits. But have a mouthpiece in the mouth. And the test is drop your hands, right? In the middle of a drill. Someone's supposed to be doing a jab at you or whatever or one-two or whatever. Uh, in the middle of it, bite down on your mouthpiece. Put your chin down. Like you saw in my defense video I had where I had uh, one of our coaches punch me in the face. And, and, and let a shot come. And you'll know right away if they're aiming for where they need to be aiming for. And if they miss you, that's a problem. That's a big problem. All right? We don't get better by, by playing basketball where we're purposely missing the hoop. No one would make a case for that. Oh, I'm being nice. I'm purposely missing the hoop. No, no, no. You're, you're not doing the sport. This is the sport. It's called boxing. All right. So that's one way that you fix that, though, is in the middle of the drill, if you're suspicious of it, or just test it. Bite down on the mouthpiece, right? Put your chin down and see if a shot gets you. If it got you, cool. If it misses you, ah, you're purposely missing me, all right? Now, and this is, again, how we make training real. Now, throwing punches with the knuckles. Too often, we'll throw the punches in a drill, particularly hooks, with a slap. And it, it's, a, it's a range thing. It's a few other things. It's, it's an aiming thing like the first item. But we'll, we'll throw punches that are not connecting with the knuckles. We have to make sure that we're throwing that punch so that if it didn't get blocked, it would be connecting with the knuckles, uh, not slapping or pawing. And then the last thing is snapping punches. Once you get the motion of the drill, right? Let's say someone's brand new or you're brand new and you're getting the motion of slipping and blocking and catching punches. Once you have that down, there needs to be some snap to the punch. I'm not saying a push. A push is not a snap. There needs to be some snap to that punch that's coming at you so you can learn how to resist, how to brace for it, how to properly respond to a punch that is real punch. If all the punches are always just completely open-handed touches, 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 it's not real at all. Now, granted, this is all titrated, though, to who you're working with. Let's say you have someone like myself that's maybe a little bit bigger and whatnot, a little bit more experienced, and I'm working with someone a lot smaller, then... I might not squeeze tight at the end of the punch, right? I'll, I'll, I'll titrate that snap to what seems appropriate for that size I'm working with to be beneficial for them. But I'm also just not going to just touch them like they're a piece of glass, all right? So again, if you do a drill and you don't take these things into account, these three things into account, aiming for target areas, you're making yourself worse and you're making your partner worse and completely nullifying any benefit of a drill. Uh, if you're not connected with the knuckles, again, you're completely nullifying your ability to score as an amateur or your ability to be effective as a pro and then and as an amateur. But then also, if we're not snapping our punches, what are you training for? Because also, we need to be able to throw at people with snap. And a drill is a great time to throw punches with maximum power. What do I mean? Once the partner has it down, and as you tack up your power a little bit, this allows you to feel your balance and all of the things necessary in order to hit somebody hard. Why can we go hard in a drill when someone's ready for it? Because they know exactly what's coming in a drill, right? Depending what type of drill it is. But if it's the first type of drill I'm talking about, they know exactly what's coming and when it's coming. So therefore, that's the best time that you can put 100% force with a punch if it's someone of equal size and hopefully experience or they're just able to deal with it. And uh, and you get that ability because too often we, we have a disconnect. We're good at hitting, again, inanimate objects, bags hard, mitts hard. But then some of us, when we hit people, we don't do it hard. You know, right? That might not be your problem, but that's some people's problem. Or, let me put it this way, hit somebody hard, but actually hitting them hard correctly. What do I mean by that? By not muscling the punch, right? We'll go into sparring, we'll go into fighting, and we, we burn our arms out because we're trying to hit hard with our arms instead of using our body to hit hard. Because we've gotten used to hitting a bag, but a bag is not a person. This is not the sport of boxing, right? We're used to hitting air just to demean shadow boxing. Again, shadow boxing is the most important thing you can do outside of sparring, but you're good at hitting air hard, but when it comes to actually hitting a person, you're having a trouble, trouble you know, connecting the two pieces. And this is, again, this is where drills are the bridge. All right, so first type of drill, of the two types of drills categories, is closed drills closed drills so what does closed drill mean it means you have the least amount of options it's the most controlled right think about it this way 
in, in terms of the sport of basketball. You're standing at the free throw line throwing free throws. This type of training is very ben beneficial for one type of person. The type of person is someone that's more a beginner. It becomes not beneficial for someone that's more advanced, as for reasons I'll talk about later. But a closed drill is essential. And it's basically the first level of training that we all kind of get stuck at and people repeat for their entire career. But it's still important. A closed drill would be somebody doing a precise thing over and over again at a certain timing that is predictable that allows the both partners to get comfortable, to get used to it, and to have success with the purpose of the drill, all right? So let me give you some examples of drills that I like for beginners, but also you could utilize this for intermediate as well, particularly if you don't drill. If you don't drill and you drill this the right way, meaning the three things I talked about earlier, aiming, uh, hitting with the knuckles, and also snapping punches, putting power with it, you'll have a benefit for it if you're not used to it, and then I'll give you the keys to how you make it better when you get used to it. All right, so first one is countering the jab closed drill. All right, so the first drill for this. Uh, be, why are we going to talk about countering the jab? Because, as we know, the jab is the most important punch in boxing. It's also the most likely punch to come in boxing. So we need to become very proficient at countering it. The better you are at dealing with the jab and taking someone's jab away, the better boxer you're going to be, arguably. So that's where it is very, very, very important for a beginner, intermediate, and even advanced to always be familiarizing themselves and, and repping out dealing with a jab and taking away a jab. So, now again, this is closed, so it's, it's more simple, it's more basic. Counter after, every, uh, counter after single jabs with, and here are your options. Now again, if you're, if you're being ultra closed, you only pick the first option. So the first option here is you catch a jab with your rear hand and counter with a jab or a two, all right? And your partner catches the counter. They catch the counter jab or they catch the counter two or they block the counter two or they slip it, right? They can do whatever they want. And again, if you're a real new beginner, you have one response defensively. Let's say it's a catch of the counter jab. And again, if you're a real beginner and you're the person being jabbed at, you're going to be catching those jabs. If you're a little bit more advanced, you can mix in stepping out of it, slipping it, things like that. Things like that. And think about how this type of drill allows you to build up a familiarity with a lot of factors you need as a boxer outside of just sparring. Because you can drill really often. You can't spar really often. Or you could. You could. But you're increasing the likelihood of hurting yourself. But if we're drilling, you know a single jab is coming. See, key, as I said, single jab. So you know it's a single jab. It's not a double jab. And so therefore, if you're paying attention and it's titrated right as far as intensity, you are having a real punch come at you and you are not getting hit. This is the type of training we need as a boxer for sustainability, but also for ability to grow as a fighter. Now, if you want to add a variable in there, right, make it a little bit more varied, right? You could also mix in a slip to the lead side, shoot the jab, or slip to the rear side, shoot a right hand, a two. And again, the beauty of it is, is that if partner A is doing single jabs and partner B is the one countering the single jab, uh, partner A knows the counter of their jab is a straight punch. So again, we're closed options. It's, it's very clear what the counter is when it does come. So therefore, they can also be ready for it. All right? And we're, we're simplifying everything down, building up those reps and ability, and then we can expand it out as we go along. All right? Now, the keys to this drill and to all closed drills, but with this drill specifically, uh, don't counter every time. All right? So what do I mean by that? Don't counter when you're not ready. When you're getting this down, Get yourself good and ready. So what are you doing when you're not ready? You're catching the jab, you're stepping out of the jab, whatever. And if you're brand new, you're just catching the jab. That's it, you're standing there, catching. But as, as you're more advanced, then you, you you vary it up a little bit. You move around the ring a little bit around the floor. You're stepping out of jabs, slipping inside of jabs, catching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Now, another key to this is it's a single jab, like I mentioned earlier. There's no doubles and triples. So again, it's, it's less variables. There's no fainting right? It's the single jab and it's it's targeted to the head, right? So we're not mixing it up like that. We're, again, it's closed, closed. Think about simple, less. Uh, and then also it's set to the pace of the partner, meaning if partner A is throwing jabs at partner B and partner B 
is not able to defend and or eventually counter the jab by partner A, partner A needs to attack it back. They need to either slow it down or they need to take some power off the jab, right? Because it could be one of those two variables uh, if they're not doing other things like fainting or trying to mix it up. And maybe you could say a third thing is they need to keep an even rhythm with when they throw their jab. Because again, more closed options. As we get more advanced, then they change up the timing between jabs. But we'll talk about that later, all right? So again, very simple and basic. Someone shooting single jabs at you, you catching the jab. When you're ready, you're countering with these options, a straight punch. And again, the key to good counters though, right, is it also allows you in this controlled setting to build up the proper timing. The proper timing of not waiting too long for the counter to get that one and rhythm, not one, two, one and, right in between the punches. Because after a jab, most of the time comes what? A right hand, a two. So therefore, we want to get our jab or our counter right hand or whatever it is before the follow-up shot can come. All right. If you wait for the, for the timing to be too long in between your def defense and your counter, they're not there anymore, or they threw more punches and you got nailed. All right. But this is where we build up these abilities. If you're having trouble in sparring with timing, a closed drill like this will help you out a lot. All right. Now southpaw version for this. Again, single jabs. Same thing. We're catching and coming over their jab or under their jab with a counter jab. And that's about the large amount of it. You could brush with the lead hand, come with a jab. But really simply, you're catching with the rear hand. And when you're ready, catch, shoot your jab. Or you could catch and shoot your two off of it. It would be a little bit more awkward to do. Uh, you could do a brushing or blocking the lead hand, uh, with the lead hand rather, or the, you know, the two hands that run into each other. So if I'm a right-hander against a southpaw, southpaw shoots a jab at me. I might brush or block with my left hand to counter with my right hand. Now, also, this allows you to learn range because, again, I'm thinking right now of the two opposite stance fighters, right? Um, oftentimes, someone's nice and long with that jab, and if I block with my lead hand and counter with my rear hand, my two, it, uh, it's, you know, sometimes there's a delay, things like that, and, and the range can be different. But this is where I can practice very important techniques that I need to learn as a fighter. The ability to block a punch as I step slightly forward to get myself in range for that two, right? Or as I brush that jab to the side, then step in with the two to make it land, all right? And then again, the the, the opposite stance fighter that is having the counter coming to them, all they gotta do is put their rear hand in front of their face, have it off their face, and defend and catch and or slip or step out of the counter shots. Now, countering the jab the second closed drill. Again, we're talking simple, basic, right? So countering the single jab at the same time. So it's a little bit harder because when we do, do choose to counter, there is no delay at all, obviously, uh, as it is with a counter like a block shoot or catch shoot or slip shoot. This is occurring at the same exact time. And what I find through my experience working with boxers is that this takes a little bit more ability. So that's why it's the second option for closed drills. But you can literally start as we get to more advanced ideas, you can take these two, two drills and put them together, all right? Now, so we're gonna catch the jab, uh, and when we're ready, we're gonna catch the jab and jab same time. So again, we're countering the jab, and we're shutting someone up as they're jabbing the same exact time. You guys at a box for any period of time, you know how, it eff how effective it is that when you start a punch, if you get hit right as you're throwing your punch, that is pretty, pretty irritating. It's pretty annoying. Yeah, and it can be frankly sometimes demoralizing. Versus the guy that always waits until you're done to counter, you can deal with that. It still sucks. It's still problems. But let's say I shoot a jab and I know after a jab, a counter might be coming that he nails me with. It's easier for my mind to wrap around that. But if when I throw a jab, I'm, I'm, I'm going to punch this guy and I get ripped the same exact time. One, it's hard to see it coming oftentimes, but two, it, it, your, your body starts associating, hey, when I throw that punch, I get hit the same exact time. That sucks. Let me stop doing that. It's not the right response, but that is the response and that's how we take away someone's weapon. All right. So we catch the jab and we jab same time. Basic jab and catch same exact time. So if they're not catching, you're nailing their, their jaw with your jab. Uh, 
and uh, very, very, very good move. Great way to shut down a jab. And, of course, the other partner would be needing to focus on catching and jabbing at the same time. Very basic thing, but very important, right? The beauties and the basics and, and the fundamentals. And oftentimes, even elite fighters have to go back to that or are lacking parts of that, which, just like the foundation of a house, if it's not done correctly or it weathers away over time, you're going to have big problems. All right, then slip and a two to the body, all right? So think about that jab is I'm going to slip to my lead side. That jab is going to go past my, if I'm orthodox, my right ear, and I'm going to put my right hand on their body. Now, obviously, and it's going to come the same time the jab comes. Now, obviously, this is a drill. Am I going to throw my right hand or my two or my two to the body as hard as I can? No, because there's not anything defensively they can do about it, right? They have their jab stuck out. We're maybe luring them in to step with the jab, and we're slipping past that jab and putting our right hand on their ribs, on their left ribs or their lead ribs. Uh, we, we just need to pop it. Don't dig it. Just pop it. Get used to that. That's the one thing you want to be aware of that, is that if the drill is done in a fashion that it's unavoidable to get hit by the counter, like literally it's just unavoidable, then you obviously don't want to apply the things I talked about earlier about putting a lot of snap on it or full maximum power because you're not going to have a partner anymore. Then the uh, other option is to slip to the rear side. Oh, sorry. So slip to the lead side and the right cross or the rear cross. So crossing over the jab, arcing over. And again, that would be defended by either popping the shoulder up enough if you were the partner A jabbing, doing the lead, or catching, bringing that right, uh, rear hand across enough to catch that shot coming over. And then the last one is slipping to your rear side as you jab the same time, right? So that jab goes past, if you're orthodox, past your left ear, and you jab right for their jaw. And if they're not catching, they're going to get hit by it. And again, throughout this whole time, you're reinforcing fundamentals. You know, I'm thinking about all the things that you know we see all the time with people of, of varying levels. But the chin is down. When you're catching, your chin isn't popping up. Because oftentimes, when you're defending punches, it's a funny thing. Your brain will tell you that the force is coming for, let's say, your hand that's catching, but not realizing the force was intended for your head. So therefore, you'll lift your head away from your hand that's catching, and where actuality, your hand is the shield, right? So you need to hide behind the shield. Don't try to get away from the shield, right? Uh, there's just a little nuance there. It's very important. All right, so now the keys is uh, when you're ready or when you're not ready, catch, right? When you're not ready, just catch the punch or slip the punch and don't throw a punch. But don't force yourself to do this, at least initially, when you're not ready, not set. So therefore, the timing is off. Take that time in, a, in this type of drill to slow it down in your mind, to control the factors you can control because it's one punch coming at you. And, and get it right. Get the drill right. Be successful. Doing a drill where you're not accomplishing the point of the drill and doing that over and over again means you're also not getting benefit from that drill either. So you, therefore, you got to slow it down or break it down, close it up until you start getting it right again, and then start tacking it back up again. Uh, again, no feints with the jab for this one, only head jabs, and set to the pace of the partner. So therefore, you know, if, if I'm shooting my jab in a manner that's fast enough or just done in a way that you can't see it coming and I'm nailing you with a jab every time, like, yes, if you're a higher level and I tack it up there a little bit, that is beneficial. But if you repeatedly are unable to answer it, then I probably need to tack it down a little bit. But it's a good little thing for my mind to know, okay, that's how I will shoot a jab that somebody's going to have trouble seeing it. And eventually the partner needs to be able to see it, but it might not be that day, all right? Rome wasn't built in a, day, in a day. Any great boxer was not built in a day, or even good boxer. All right, southpaw version of this. This is where it gets really simple, is that that, that jab comes out, and you slip, shoot that two, or if you're orthodox, the right hand, if you're southpaw, left hand, straight left hand, for the jaw, they catch it. Jab and catch, same time. And, uh, yeah, it's basically that. That's your options. You could... Uh, theoretically slip to your rear side as you jab, let it go past your lead ear, your left ear, if you're orthodox, uh, and put that jab for the face. But that's what it is. It stays pretty simple. And when you're not ready, block, catch, or brush that jab. And that's it. All right, now we're going to talk about countering the one-two in a closed drill. All right? So this is where we're going to get into a little bit of 
kind of the the jargon that we use to write combinations and stuff in our whole like coaching curriculum and Kepler Boxing University and whatnot that we use for franchises and we've had a lot of coaches go through. Uh, so I'm going to ca- kind of describe this to you as we go along. And then also, by the way, there's a video of the drill for channel members that I'm going to be putting up soon. So look out for that. If you're not already a channel member, become a channel member. Level one or level two, both will be able to have access to these uh, when I when I get them up. All right. So countering the one and two in the closed drill. So you'll catch the one. That's what that first one is. You catch the one, the jab. Then you block the two, right? We'll block it with our lead hand. So catch the jab, block the two. Again, this is assuming you're both same stance. And then you're countering with the two when you're ready, right? Because we need to be able to stop the one, two. Basic. We're just, we know how to stop the jab now, and we've gotten used to countering the jab. We need to be able to counter first off the fend, but then also counter the one, two. All right? So we catch block and counter with the two when we're ready. When you're not ready, just catch block, catch slip, et cetera. Catch step out, step out, and step to the side, that type of thing. Uh, then the other option for countering the one, two is you catch the one, you slip the two. So SL means slip to your lead side. And then 3B, which is the left hook to the body or the lead hook to the body, right? So catch, slip, throw that body shot. Beautiful setup. And if you're against the orthodox and orthodox, that's the liver. And uh, in this situation, if your partner can bring the elbow back fast enough off their two, you dig the shot. If they can't, you touch it. Ideally, you get your timing good enough that they almost can't get there fast enough. And so therefore, you just touch it. Or if they can't get there fast enough, you start digging in a little bit because you need to build up not only the aim, the timing, but the ability to throw power when it needs to be thrown. All right, then catch the one and uh, you do a two and you slip with the two at the same exact time. All right, let me tell you how you make this work. So again, two same stance fighters. And again, to be clear, to benefit somebody, if you're a southpaw, have your partner go southpaw just to do this. It's good because as a southpaw, you're going to face other southpaws. And as an orthodox, you're going to face other orthodox. It's going to happen, right? So I recommend, you know, mixing into what is your default stance, but then also uh, modifying your stance to the partner. It won't hurt you, uh, particularly, particularly as you progress. Now, so we catch that one. And then as that two comes, we bring our head offline. That punch slips past our our rear ear, and we touch the two. But where do we touch it? We're not going to touch it for the jaw. We're not going to touch it for the stomach either. We could, but we're going to touch it right below the jaw on the chest, all right? So we're going to put it right there and put a little pop on it, but that gets us close enough aim-wise to where the the line of the jaw would be. And we know if we just brought it up a few inches, it would be connecting right on the sweet spot on the button and boxing on the tip of the chin. So that is how you run that drill, catch the jab, slip, and shoot your two same time as the two comes. Beautiful counter. Beautiful counter. Then another one is you slip with that jab to the rear side, right? So if you're orthodox, you'll be jabbing and slipping to your right side. And then you're just going to be turning or pivoting or spinning around to your right side or your rear side. That gets you past and out of the alleyway completely of a right hand. It's an, it's an avoidance method, but think about it. If they were shooting a one-two, they probably weren't ready for a jab at the same time as their jab. So we're snapping their head with the jab. Uh, We took away their jab. They didn't land that. And we slid around the side door, and their two wasn't there to land either. So great stuff. Again, obviously, a picture is worth a thousand words or whatever the phrase is, and a a video is worth a million. So watching these drills on video will be very helpful. Then the keys. Don't counter every time, right? If you force yourself to counter every time and you're not at a higher level, you're going to get sloppy with it. Let's try to make each rep as good as we can, all right? Uh, When you're not ready, catch and block. Again, single jab, no feint, so meaning we're not gonna, you know, fake our start and then go, we're gonna just start. Uh, And then the one, two stays to the head, and then you set the pace to the partner, like I talked about, all right? Southpaw version of this, them shooting the one and two, is where it gets a little nuanced, but it's fun. Uh, Really, when I say southpaw, just think of people that are mirror stance, right? So opposite stances to each other. So that one comes, they can catch that. Uh, they can catch that one, or rather, excuse me, one of the easiest thing they can do is just slip that one and shoot their two. Same time, it could take away the follow up two of the uh, opposite stance fighter. But they can they can block the one or catch the one, and then they can slip off to the rear side with their jab, right? So that's where you're you're fighting someone or, or drilling against somebody or sparring against somebody that's an opposite stance of you. Remember when they shoot their two out there. That's, that's an opportunity for your jab. 
And so you can slip with your jab same time, or you can catch their two and jab same time. And it's a great way to to take away somebody's uh, power shot. Then also as well, you could slip past the first punch, the jab, and touch the, if, if you're orthodox against the southpaw, touch the liver, or just touch the ribs right there, slip, hit it, and then spin off to that lead side, and that will again get you out of the lane and the pathway of their two, right? Those are just some, some basic things you can do uh, if it's opposite stance. Now, make sure, guys, you're watching this so far. Most people that watch this are not subscribed, but make sure you, you do a like because that's really important for YouTube and algorithm and all that stuff. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We're almost at 12,000. That's phenomenal. A year ago, I never thought I'd be hitting up to here. So this is really just, uh, I'm just flabbergasted. Uh, and then, you know, buy me a, a, a coffee with a super thanks, right? Uh, let me just kind of take this moment to show what I'm talking about with that. So... I'm here, if I go to like a video, like on this video you see, you see this thing that says super thanks, it says heart, it says thanks, and I mean, goodness gracious, if you wanted to do $500, $400, but of course that's a lot, it's a lot of coffee, maybe I need a lot of coffee, but 20 bucks, 15 bucks, 10 bucks, five bucks, buy and send, and that's it guys, so it's a really awesome way to support the channel, as well as just becoming a channel member uh, if you become level two you get to uh, send me your your fight sparring training videos and I'll give you analysis just like this same exact method and uh, give you tips and strategies you can use to, to make your training better and help you get to the next level or if you're just level one you'll get to see the drills that I'm gonna be talking about all right so make sure you stick around also by the way for the end of this video where I'm gonna give you a bonus burnout drill all right, so drills with a partner can be used or are used for, for technique primarily, but also they can be used for technique and conditioning as well. A lot of, a lot of awesome things we can do with drills. All right, now moving on to the next thing. For people as you get more advanced or if you are a little bit more advanced or if you're just repping out these closed drills so well that they're not stimulating you anymore. All right, and I'm going to talk about why it's important. All right, so closed drills. Uh, the key to better training as you progress. If you don't, uh, sorry, open drills. If you, if you don't start opening it up, which, so you got closed drills, open drills. If you don't start adding variety, making it more real, right? So we made it real with a closed drill with just putting some power on the punches and aiming for target areas. That made it more real, made it more of what actually boxing is. But we're doing it in a controlled fashion because it's more closed. There's less options. We're going to add variables now. We're going to keep everything that we built up with the closed drills, and now we're gonna get more open with it, all right? Uh, so here's an example of a great open drill uh, for defensive abilities and countering abilities, all right? So you have one partner shooting a one, two, or a one, three, all right? This is like same stance. So what is beautiful about this is that through the philosophy that I was taught from Chuck Bodak, who worked with over 50 world champions, and the lineage of coaching that he passed on to my father, who worked with many pro fighters, Golden Glove champions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in Chicago and in the Southeast, and then with myself for my 14 years of coaching. Uh, the rear hand is very, very important for defense, all right? Because think about it. Your lead hand, you throw what with? The most important punch in boxing, the jab. You know that. So therefore, if that is the most important punch in boxing, if we're going to take that concept for granted and just accept that the most important punch in boxing generally is the jab, the one, the lead hand, then what do you need defensively? Yes, feet help. Yes, head movement help. But you have two arms. The other arm should have an employment opportunity for defense, right? That's its job, really. The lead hand's job is the primary form of offense and of starting most of the time whether it's with a, a jab or a lead hook and things like that and the rear hand has a very important job it's getting set up it's getting loaded right for and and everything's getting uh properly prepared to maybe hit them with that hand but also while it's not being used it needs to be doing some work and the work it does is defense so therefore the drill like this helps us build up our defensive abilities with our back hand how do i mean if you catch the one-two, 
And I recommend just work on catching a one, two. Yes, catching and blocking is great. Like catch the jab, block the two. Very good. It's great. Nothing wrong with that at all. Catch and roll the, you know, shoulder roll the, the two. Fine move as well. And you're obviously slipping and, you know, footwork, everything else. But just be able to catch both the one and the two. Catch, catch. All right? You need to get the timing of the resistance. All right? And that's where, again, drilling this. Having a partner throwing a one-two at you that progressively gets harder so you can build up the timing of when to contract your arm. You keep your hand open, but when to contract your arm muscles to resist that punch. Keep Keeping your elbows in and everything else and not reaching out too far and not having it close enough to your jaw that you're just rattling your own brain. Again, to be clear, if in sparring or in a fight, which would you rather get hit by? A one-two that hits you clean or a one-two that, you know, jarred you a little bit because your hand was on your face, right? I would rather the, the latter. But what I would like more than either of those is to be able to catch the one-two a few inches off my face and therefore take off any of the rattling of my brain, right? That would be awesome. The less we can rattle our brain as a boxer, the better. So let's do that, my friends. For, for current health, long-term success with boxing, and also long-term health with life because there is life after boxing. Now, so we're catching the one-two, but also being able to catch the one, block the three, the lead hook, because that's what people are going to try to catch us with when they see us trying to catch, right? We'll be catching a jab, let's say, and that three comes around real sneaky, that lead hook, and if we're not, if we don't have that ability to snap back quickly, we're going to be suffering at some point as we go up levels. So being able to catch, catch, or catch, block, catch, block with that one hand and building that ability to do that. So therefore, our lead hand is as free as possible to do whatever we want, whenever we want. In the middle of their one, three, we snap their head with a jab. In the middle of the one, two, whatever it is, right after the one, two, you get that left hook for the body, whatever. So building up that ability is what this does. So we don't know when they're going to do a one, two, or when they're going to do a one, three. They're not going to do anything else, but we have two variables now. And two variables which are a little bit sneaky, which you have to really focus on. Do this drill with a partner that if you have ability with boxing, also has ability with boxing. And keep it simple like this, but just have this opened aspect of it, of it's a 1-3 or a 1-2. And man, you'll, you'll see, you got to focus. You got to focus. And that's what makes a good drill. All right. And then when you're ready off of the 1-2 or 1-3, you counter with a 2-3. Now, of course, you can mix in catching and rolling, catching and blocking. The two, but try to, like I said, build up that rear hand ability. But when you're ready, counter with a two, three. And so, so your response is closed. It doesn't change. It changes when it happens. So the, the guy that's shooting the one, two, and the one, three, he's got to be aware the whole time. If he falls asleep and doesn't pay attention, you're going to be popping him with the two, three. So he's got to focus, all right? Uh, and then also things that come into play are things like range, right? Someone does a one two on you and you're coming back with a two three, that's a little bit long, uh, shorter range punches, the twos and the threes, uh, particularly the three, obviously. Uh, so you might get the two, but you're not going to get the three, and especially if they step out a little bit. So, therefore, this allows you to work on all the things you need to work on to get to the next level in boxing. Being able to defend punches as we slightly creep forward for when we're intending to counter. Also, sometimes luring them in, slightly stepping out as or stepping out of the three, right? We catch a jab, step out of the three, or step out of the two. We're luring them in to make them want to maybe reach a little bit more to land the punches, right? And then while we're doing that, we're also setting the trap for them to be in range for our two and three, right? So it's still closed in a sense, but it's it's open. There's enough variable that a lot of boxers of, of many levels are gonna have to, to focus pretty well. All right, now example two is chest shots while the partner hooks, all right? So this is a really open drill, okay? Uh, and again, look out for a video of this drill for channel members. And if you're not a member already, become one, level one or level two, get this, all right? So this will be coming out soon. With this drill, one partner is just punching somebody's chest. Not hard, all right? So this is an example of we are not going to throw with absolute snap or the weight of our body because it's going to diminish the importance of the drill. Also, too, it will be counteract. It will be counter uh, effective or it will, it will counter the effectiveness of what we're looking to gain out of this drill. All right, what I find working with boxers and through my own experience boxing is that when we're, when we're defensive, we're defensive. And when we're offensive, we're offensive. And the key to becoming a, a good boxer or even maybe a great boxer down the road, you don't know what you might be, 
is, is blending the two together. The best boxes you can think of blend the two together. All right. Uh, and, and the worse the boxer is, the more it is I'm offensive and I'm wide open and I, I don't see punches coming when I throw punches. And then when I'm defensive, I'm not throwing. Right. So, again, the, the more we blend it together, the better we get. This is a great way in a controlled manner outside of just sparring. Because, again, the answer can just be sparring, to be clear. And that is the answer for most people. But I'm trying to give you more answers, more answers that you can rep out more, that you can do more. And then, therefore, by more volume, we can maybe get more benefit. Ideally, you don't need to be sparring more than maybe twice a week. Maybe. Okay? But really, ideally, maybe once a week. Uh, because for all the reasons you know. All right? But doing stuff like this, we can do this every day. And if we can do this every day, imagine how many incremental improvements we will make that will then transfer to actually what we're trying to do. Right? Sure, you jump rope every day. Sure, you hit the bag every day. Sure, you shadow box every day. And sure, you do mitt work maybe every day. You probably don't, but let's just say you did. Outside of maybe the shadow boxing and you visualizing the shadow boxing, you're probably not making like that many improvements past a certain point. Now, when you do drills like this, though, you are. And when you shadow box with visualization, you are. And then you plug that into your sparring, you are. Right? And that's the key. All right? So anyway, so when we're throwing punches, we're oftentimes not paying attention for what's coming back. All right? Uh, if you do, great. Good for you. And let's get better at it. But chances are you're probably not that good at it. Now, we're throwing punches at a partner's chest. Partner's going to be kind of open. When a partner wants, they're going to throw a hook at us. And we can keep it simple. We can make it head hooks, but then as we make it more open, you can do head or body hooks. But they're just going to throw a right hook or a left hook, right? Single shot and mix up the timing on it. And they're not going to try to knock you out with the hook to start off. And they'll, they'll get a little bit harder as they go. And But the key is for you as the beneficiary or benefactor of the drill is to be throwing straight punches at the chest. You're throwing straight punches at the chest right below their jaw. Right? Because you want to keep your aiming relatively accurate. We don't want to get used to just punching people in the chest. We want to just shoot right below where the jaw is. So therefore, it's, it's a very similar feel. So we're doing that while we're watching the center and the chest. With our peripheral vision, we're watching for punches. So you're, and you're, you're punching kind of light. Why are we punching kind of light? Because we're keeping the arms going. So one, we don't burn ourselves out. But two is that if you start trying to punch hard, then you might start going into that place that you're trying to get yourself out of where you're only focused on the punch you're throwing and not what's coming. But you throwing a little bit lighter allows you to just watch, watch, watch. And then as a punch comes, you react defensively and, and touch back again. We block, we step out, we go under, all right? So we're doing our shots, doing our shots, they do a hook, you make a miss, and then you pop back. You pop, 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 pop. And the goal is to be mindlessly kind of punching lightly as we're watching to get to start bridging the gap again of blending offense and defense together right it's a very very important tool and it's very very beneficial and I, i've seen this with my guys that they'll when they're not used to blending the defense and offense together a drill like this will reveal that you'll start seeing and they'll feel oh they're they're kind of stopping the shot they're doing or they're or they're getting hit by a shot even as they're throwing light punches because they're they haven't yet connected the two things in their mind completely all right now talking about the keys to good technical drills or the key to good technical drills all drills with all drills they need to require the focus of you or if you're a coach of your athlete for it to be beneficial so they they require focus and what does that mean that means that Obviously, if we're doing like bag work and shadow boxing, then it's up to the person that is doing the activity to focus, right? It's up to their discipline, truly, their discipline to focus. Uh, and you can see, and you know yourself if you're not focusing, but also as a coach, you can see someone's just mindlessly hitting the bag, not thinking. I, I see it all the time. And it needs to be called out all the time because you just putting in mindless reps is not beneficial. And that, that has been shown, from my understanding, with sports science and motor learning. That you just, if you're able to just do it and not, not be, it, rather do it in your training uh, and, your, and the stuff that's actually supposed to be making you better and not requiring focus. I'm not saying flow. I'm saying, you know, just zoning out, right? You're just going through motions. That's no good. Focus. Doesn't mean you're gritting your teeth and 
you know, your brain's hurting because you're trying to focus so darn hard. But getting to that state where you are completely in the moment, you're not thinking about anything else, you are focused. A good drill, a good technical drill has to bring you there. And this is where you titrate it to, to make it like that. And that's what's great about drills. It's not up to your discipline. It forces you to be in the moment of focus. Again, if we're doing a one-two drill, and I know Bob is always doing the one-two at the same time. He's always starting it at the same time. And I know the timing. It's going to be like a three count between every time he does it. And he's always standing in one spot. At my ability of boxing, I can lose focus, right? Now, as we progress the drill, make it more open. If I don't know if Bob's doing a one-two or a one-three, now I got to start focusing. Because if I don't, I'm going to get touched. And if he's doing, doing the drill like I talked about earlier, aiming for target areas, putting some pop on it, I don't like getting touched. And so I'm going to get popped on the jaw with a one-three maybe or get hit with the one-two. And that's not fun. So now automatically, I'm focused. Automatically. All right? And then if Bob's moving around, right, that's more open. And then we could talk about where then, as we get more open with our drills, you could take one of the closed drills and then add open elements to it. Let's say he is now fainting his start, right? So it's just one type of faint maybe. He's just going to faint the jab sometimes instead of start with a jab. Then when he's ready, it might be a faint one too or it might be a faint he does nothing. So now you got to get used to that. And also it's a great opportunity, guess what, for Bob to work on his feints. You know, we talked about it in the whole video you need to watch that I did on fainting. Talked about how to faint, how to practice fainting. But this is a great way to do it, is to do it with these drills. And again, this is this is really bridging the gap between taking your technical stuff and taking it and actually applying it in the sport that you're doing called boxing, where you're trying to hit somebody and minimize how much you get hit. All right. Talking about bonus burnout drill. Here it is. So, again, with talking about like kind of our system of numbers, shorthand that we use throughout all of our Kepner boxing locations and whatnot. So, the 6B43. So, 6B, what's that? That's the rear hook, right? So, your orthodox, your right hook, your southpaw, your left hook to the body. So, 6B4, 4 is the rear uppercut. If you're orthodox, the right uppercut. And then the 3, we all know what the 3 is, right? And this was funny with boxing numbers, right? We're all in agreement, unless you're in the peekaboo system. We're all in agreement on the one, twos, and threes. And that's where for the longest time when I coached, I didn't talk past a, uh, a one, two, and a three. I would just call like a right uppercut or a right hook or whatever. Because there's a little bit of uh, disagreement. But what I've found generally is that more of the fitness boxing type people and cardio boxing type people, therefore, is the right hook or the rear hook. And with more of the old school style, if they do apply numbers to it, which oftentimes they don't, but when they do, it's the rear uppercut. Why the rear uppercut? Let me take a moment to talk about this. You, when you're a boxer, you know what are the punches you land the most. Generally, it's the one, two, and the three, right? That's probably the, those are the punches you're going to land the most. Uh, and if you look at knockouts, those are the punches that oftentimes, you know, maybe not the one, but the twos and the threes are going to be getting people the most. Now, the the four is situational, meaning the, the rear uppercut, right? And the five is as well, right? If they're not in a certain body position, it might not land. The five might be able to get through, but the four, maybe not. But the six, or what we call the six, the right hook, some old school coaches don't even don't even teach it. My dad taught it. He was definitely an old school coach. But a lot of coaches don't even teach it. Man, I know even one coach who's kind of not a good coach, but he would even like say that the right hook or rear hook doesn't exist, which is the dumbest thing you could ever say, but he was that he was that extreme. It's it's a punch that a lot of coaches don't teach, at least in the old school. Why is that? You know, you're like, oh man, you're not teaching a punch? That's ridiculous, especially nowadays in the modern era where we do learn or teach or talk about or see, especially on social media, a wide variety of types of punches, right? More than I ever saw, you know, back 20 years ago as far as just little little details and nuances of different types of punches. But anyway, the right hook, the rear hook, is the only punch I've had to, to ban from boxers. They're like, wow, Coach Keith, you banned a punch from boxers? Yeah, absolutely, to make them better. And it did. Okay, I had two people that come to mind and uh, both very, very good fighters. And during their first few fights, five or six, they would go jab and right hook crazy, right hook crazy. And if they would just straighten out that right hand and make it straight, they would have landed it. 
but they'll miss it. They'll slap it. It will arc around someone's head or come up too short. Or they'll get countered as they're doing it. Why? Because that right hook or rear hook is the slowest punch to throw, particularly for the head. It takes the most time. And if you're boxing against another person that's the same stance as you, it has the least places to land. Think about it. With the way someone is sided up, you have more of their back and their shoulders in the way versus the lead hook. Because with the lead hook, what makes it beautiful is that whether it's the head or the body, if that person's rear hand, if you're both the same stance, if that person's rear hand is not in perfect position or exactly the position it needs to be or whatever, if it's slightly off, it can find a home. It can find a place to land. So you need to watch out for that. Uh, and that's why the three is more important than a rear hook. And again, most people, they're, they're strong with their right, so therefore they want to throw that right. And they'll overthrow the right, number one. But also the doing the loopy right hook, even a good right hook, it just takes more time. It has the less available places to land, typically. All right, so anyway, I say all that, and here we're doing it in a drill, but we're doing it situational. We're on the inside. 6B43. If this is a combination that reminds you of anybody, it should. Mike Tyson, right? Loves the hook to the body in the uppercut, right? We buckle, buckle them with the body shot, rip them up with the uppercut up the middle with the same hand. Doubling up with one hand is so important. And the other partner is blocking the right hook to the body, catching the uppercut, the four, and weaving under. So WR is weave rear. So you're weaving under to your rear side. And that sets you to come right back with your rear hook for the body, rear uppercut three. So body uppercut three, and then you block, catch, weave under. And you go back and forth, back and forth. Tell you what, I'll show you a video of this drill just, uh, just, to, give it, just to give it to you so you can see it. So here it is. Boom. Boom, boom, bam, boom, boom, bam, like that. We're trying to aim for target areas, trying to not go for the arm, but trying to come around the elbow as much as possible. And again, you know, no one's perfect. There's always things like, hey, we could come around a little bit more and things like that. That's what that's one thing is you can always see opportunities for improvement. But this is a great burnout drill that not only uh, gets you better at boxing, but also will help you increase conditioning because, you know, at the end of the day, you need to... Uh, Get better conditioned at the exact stuff you do when you box. Not better at jumping rope conditioning, not better at running conditioning. All these things help. But to get your arms conditioned to blocking punches, to get yourself conditioned to throwing punches at people, like I talked about not being too tight but still throwing with enough pop and power that it's effective, this is where stuff like this is really helpful. All right? Make sure if you like this video, you click that like button, you subscribed. Chances are you're watching this, you're not subscribed, so please subscribe, really would appreciate it. Buy me a cup of coffee with a super thanks, right? Whether it's five bucks, 10 bucks, I had a few people do 10 bucks, that was phenomenal. Got, got a nice two cups of coffee off that, you know, with the way inflation is. And then uh, become a channel member. You'll get to see the drills of, uh, or the videos of these different drills, uh, as well as I have a long extensive video on sparring and uh, different aspects with that, strategies and tactics. Uh, and a few other things, as well as when you become a level two member, you can send me videos of you sparring, fighting, or training, and I will give you the tips that you need that are maybe things you're missing that you haven't seen, even if you know a lot, but that second pair of eyes is always so important, and that's what makes coaches important. All right, guys, appreciate you watching. Watch out for the next video. See ya.